particular aspect is different from what we've done before because we're actually looking at the practice of meditation. So I'm giving a concrete example of how we can approach meditation. And I'm choosing two pieces of scripture, which are taken from the end of John's gospel. My aim here is to show us how we can approach scripture so it becomes prayer. Talking about prayer is one thing, but we learn to pray by praying. That's what St. Francis de Sales says. So in this audio, it won't be a video, it's an audio, there will be three stages. The first stage will be looking at the piece of scripture. So if you've got the chance yourselves to read it, it's at the end of John's gospel. Um, I think it's chapter 19 or 20 is where Peter denies Jesus. And then 21 is the resurrection of Jesus. I would invite you to read those two pieces of scripture first. Then I'm giving a commentary on those two pieces of scripture, helping us to look at it more deeply, to try and understand it better. Then having understood these two pieces of scripture better, then I'm going to move us into the actual practice of meditation. So the first part of this will be doing some exercises to quieten us down, to let go of our thinking, our feelings, and to move to that deeper place so we're more receptive to listen to what God wants to say to us through the scripture. And then we'll move into a more imaginative prayer, very much in the, in the lines of the Ignatian type of contemplation. So in this, I'm going to invite us through a guided meditation to enter into the scene and then to allow that scene to become part of our experience in our relationship with the Lord. So that we end up having a dialogue with the Lord, speaking to him and listening to him. And then we'll take a time of quiet at the end just to savor it and to give thanks to God for what we receive in that time of prayer. It's only one way of meditating. There are many different ways. But this, I feel, may help us to begin this journey. And what I do with you in this piece of scripture, you can do with any other piece of scripture where Jesus encounters another person. And you can either be a participant, you can become the other person, or an observer watching Jesus in relation to the other person. So the talk this morning is basically... The theme of the talk is let yourself be loved by God. And I'm going to focus on one of the main people in scripture, St. Peter. And I want us to look at the journey that he, that he made. When we look at his journey, then we can also look at our journey then as well too. And the journey of St. Peter that I want to look at begins at one charcoal fire and leads us to another charcoal fire. The first charcoal fire is when he denies Jesus, when Jesus is being tried. And the second charcoal fire is when Jesus speaks to him on the beach after his resurrection and asks him, does he love him? And he says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. So I want to look at that journey that he makes, the one from denying Jesus to arriving at the place of professing his love for Jesus and looking at it as a journey of mercy and the journey of God's merciful love. Now, Peter is someone we can all relate to, maybe some of us more than others, because his imperfections are very obvious. And he's the type of person who says it first and then thinks afterwards. He kind of puts his foot in it. And he often says what all the other people are thinking. And sometimes it gets him into a little bit of trouble. Now let's not forget that when Peter denies Jesus at the charcoal fire, he is on his own. Jesus is not with him. So we have to remember that it is more difficult to resist the voice of temptation and the voice of the crowd when Jesus is not with us when we're on our own. So what is the voice of the crowd today? Today, everyone is infallible except the Pope. There are no shortage of opinions, and my opinion is the truth. 
And we live in a world which encourages us to modernize. But does that mean we have to let go of what is truly valuable? The servant girl, when she sees Peter and holds the lantern to his face, she says, you're one of them. And Peter says, I don't know him. Now what's going through Peter's mind when he denies Jesus? It's because he's afraid that if he says he's a follower of Jesus, that he will end up in trouble like Jesus. So it's fear. It's fear that prevents him from saying he knows Jesus. And it is fear that gets us to follow the crowd rather than listen to the master's voice. So I want to ask the question for each one of us, what is my charcoal fire? When I look back at my life, what is the place where I feel disappointed in myself? Where maybe I feel I let the Lord down? Maybe it's a place of guilt and shame. I remember during Lent, I decided as an exercise for Lent to reflect on my past sins. Now, it wasn't a scrupulous thing, but I wanted to re reflect on my past sins, which had been forgiven, just to evoke again the sorrow I had for my sins. It's not that I didn't believe God had forgiven me. He had forgiven me, but I wanted to evoke again that sorrow I had for my sins. Because sometimes, I know myself, sometimes when I confess, I can confess my sins because I feel bad or guilty, but not because I'm truly sorrowful. And sometimes I even confess because I'm annoyed with myself, that I'm not as perfect as I would like to be, so I'm committing another sin of pride when I'm doing that. But to confess your sins with sorrow is different. And Peter arrives at that point, eventually. So when I was reflecting on my past sins, and when I was meditating on it, there was this phrase that kept coming back to my mind. When I meditated on my sins, I was sorry for my sins, but I was also grateful to God for his, his forgiveness and his mercy. So two things were happening. There was both sorrow and gratitude. Because when I thought about my sins, I said, Lord, look what I have done to you. So when we look at him on the cross, and we see the effect of our sins on the cross, then it fills us with sorrow. But at the same time, when we look at him on the cross, he's saying, I've done this for you. And this fills us with gratitude. So the two things happen at the same time. Sorrow and gratitude, sorrow for my sins, but gratitude for God's forgiveness and his mercy. When Peter denies Jesus a third time, and then when he sees Jesus face to face, he breaks down. His heart is moved. St. Francis de Sales says that at this point for St. Peter, it was like when Moses struck the rock in the desert and the water poured out. When Peter sees Jesus, after having denied him, and he sees no condemnation in the eyes of Jesus, only a gaze of, lo of love, then he is filled with sorrow. Then his heart is struck open and he weeps bitterly. So I want to make a difference between sorrow and guilt. When we do something wrong, we can feel guilt. Sometimes we feel shame when we think there's something wrong with us. But we only feel sorrow when we realize we have hurt someone. 
Guilt is always about something we have done, but sorrow is always relational. It's about a person we have hurt. So when we sin, we hurt people, we hurt God, and we hurt ourselves. And sorrow is the recognition of the hurt I have caused to this person, even to myself, and also in particular to God. But Peter doesn't receive any condemnation from Jesus when he has denied him. All he receives is a look of mercy and love. And that's what causes the sorrow in his heart. Afterwards, I wonder, whenever Peter would hear a cock crowing, did it remind him of his betrayal of Jesus? So for the rest of his life, when he'd hear that sound, what memories came back to him? Did it remind him of his weakness? As they say, every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. When I look at my own life, is there anything that causes me shame, guilt, or is there anything I cannot forgive myself for, even though God has forgiven me? Is there anything I can't let go of? Is it only now, after having denied Jesus, does Peter understand why at the Last Supper Jesus had said to him, I need to wash your feet? He had refused. He hadn't understood. Because he said, should everyone betray you, I will never betray you. Is it only now, in his weakness, when he has fallen, that he understands why Jesus needed to wash his feet? It's only in his weakness that he understands his need of mercy. After his denial of Jesus, did he find himself sinking further into grief and sorrow? Was he inconsolable as he thought about how he had denied Jesus when he needed him most? Did he find himself sinking once again? Did it remind him of the time when he had walked on the water, felt afraid, began to doubt, and then began to sink? Did he remember the words he had said to Jesus at the Last Supper? Even if everyone betrays you, I will never betray you. Does he begin to sink even further? And did he find himself once again reaching out to the Lord to be pulled up into safety? Whenever we fall, Jesus never joins in our self-condemnation. He reaches out to us to bring us back up again into safety. As I said before, what surprises God is not that we fall, but that we don't reach up to him who is reaching out to bring us back into relationship. What does Peter learn about Jesus from this experience? The first thing he learns is, with Jesus, there is no condemnation. There is only compassion, love, and mercy, and acceptance. When Jesus looks at Peter, and Peter has denied him, he receives the same look that the woman received 
who had committed adultery and was dragged before him. No judgment, no condemnation, a look of mercy, compassion and love. Peter also learns a truth about himself, a truth about his own weakness and his need or dependence on Jesus to be his saviour, to save him. But he also learns that his sin has an effect on Jesus. And we see this on the cross because Jesus allows his heart to be broken out of love for us. But we must never forget that God always loves us, always loved us. But something new happens in the life of God on the cross. Because God allows his heart to be broken out of love for us on the cross. So a new quality of God's love is born on the cross. Anyone who's had their heart broken and continues to love the person who has broken their heart will understand something of the love of God. It is one thing to love someone. It is quite another thing to love somebody with a broken heart. That is why after his resurrection, Jesus retains his wounds. Not to make us feel guilty because of what we have done, but to make us understand the depth of his love for us. There's a wonderful painting of Jesus meeting Peter on the beach by an Italian artist in Bacillum. And this is the time when Peter has come back to the Lord and is ashamed at his denial. He's trying to get away from Jesus because of his shame, but Jesus is holding on to him. He won't let go of him. How many times do we feel like that, for example, when we go to the Sacrament of Reconciliation? We're filled with shame, but Jesus is actually holding us pressing us closer to himself, letting us know his acceptance and his love and his mercy for us, like the father in the prodigal son. The more that Peter tries to get away because of his shame, the more energy Jesus has to use to hold him. And in holding him, we can see that the wounds of Jesus almost begin to open up again. The wounds of Jesus are visible. The wounds of Peter are invisible. But Peter needs to learn how to look at himself through the eyes of Jesus, as each one of us has to do. And so we move from the charcoal fire of betrayal and denial to the charcoal fire where Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? Three times. Now Peter's getting frustrated. Did you not hear me the first time, the second time? Do you not believe me? But the reason why Jesus has to ask him three times is because he denied him three times. So he knows psychologically Peter needs to know that he is forgiven each of those times. It's not that Jesus is trying to make it difficult for him. He understands Peter's psychology. He understands that Peter needs to hear three times that Jesus loves him. And the real interesting thing in the original text, in the Greek text, and this is not my idea, this is because Pope Benedict points it out, is that when we listen in English to the words, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, I love you. We actually don't see what is truly happening. You can only see it in the Greek. There are different types of love. The highest form of love is agape. 
which is a self-sacrificial love. A lower form of love is filio, which is the love of friendship. So when Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? He uses agape. Are you prepared to have a sacrificial love for me? But Peter responds by saying, I love you as a friend, filio. Jesus asks him the second time, do you love me, agape? Peter says, I love you as a friend, filio. The third time that Jesus asks him, he doesn't use agape. He says, do you love me as a friend? And Peter says, yes, I love you as a friend. Because Jesus knew that Peter, at this point, is not able to arrive at that level of love for Jesus. But he will, later. So afterwards, Jesus will say to him, a belt will be put around you and you will be taken in a direction you would rather not go, referring to how he was going to die. And at that point, Peter loves Jesus with agape. The fire on the beach is the fire of God's mercy and God's love. What I have found helpful myself, I remember I was having great difficulty with someone and I used to find it very difficult because every time I thought about what the person had said and done, I could find myself getting more annoyed and more angry. I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but okay. <laughs> so I had to find a way of how am I going to deal with this? Okay. So what I decided to do was I would... When I was walking, I used to be walking the dog, and particularly when I used to do this quite often, and sometimes these thoughts and these feelings would come up. And what I would do would be, I would imagine that my annoyance with this person was like a log, and I would place it on the fire. And I would ask that it would go up to the Lord and come back as a blessing on the person I was angry with. Now, I had quite a bonfire some days. <laughs> but I must say that the Lord helped me considerably through this. And I was praying for this person because they meant an awful lot to me. They were a family member. And there was the, the communication had broken down, not from my side, but from their side. And I prayed this, and I did it constantly. And I prayed, after six years... I had a miraculous reconciliation that I could only say is miraculous. But I also know it's the fruit of prayer. Because anger, unforgiveness, hurt can close our hearts to the grace that God wants to do with us and through us. But it's important also to recognize these things in us. We can't ignore them. If I feel angry, if I feel hurt... There's a reason why I feel it. There's always a story behind it. And the Lord understands that. But it is important that we place it on the fire of his love and mercy. And allow it to come back on the person who has hurt us as a blessing from God. That's what we're told to do in scripture. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hate you. Okay, so this is one way which I'm offering to you that you might think or consider of doing for yourselves. I did a 30-day retreat, and during the 30-day retreat, this is why I find this piece of scripture so meaningful for me, because it was the high point of my retreat. I was meditating on the, the passage of scripture where Jesus is on the shore with the apostles, and then suddenly they all went away, and there's only Jesus and myself, and we had a great chat, a great conversation. But when I went to my spiritual director, and when I spoke to the spiritual director about the experience, I talked about the fire being God's mercy, God's love, and the conversation we had. My spiritual director said to me, so there's fire between you. And it really struck me very forcefully that between God and each one of us, there is fire. The fire of intimacy, the fire of love. And that fire is his Holy Spirit that he has poured into our hearts. 
Whoever loves you, no matter how wonderful that love is, that love comes from the outside to you. You receive it as a gift. God and only God can love us from within. And he has poured his love into our hearts. The spirit of his love is in our hearts through baptism. And he loves us from within. Each one of us is a tabernacle of his presence. Because he is living within us. His fire of love, the fire between us, is in the depth of each one of our hearts. And that fire of love continues to burn in the Eucharist, as St. Francis de Sales says. When I was reflecting on this experience of the charcoal fire where Peter denies Jesus and the charcoal fire where he expresses his love for Jesus, I began to understand something about the Eucharist. Because this is the journey we make in every Eucharist that we attend. We begin with the charcoal fire of mercy and forgiveness, which is the penitential rite, where we open ourselves to God's mercy, repenting of the wrong we have done. And he leads us from that fire to this fire on the beach where he expresses his love and his intimacy for us, the fire between us, and he enters into communion with us, We receive him, and he receives us. There's a mutuality in communion. It's a mutuality of friendship and love. The heart of God enters our heart, and our hearts become one. So we have the fulfillment of his promise. Father, may they be one as you and I are one. So we enjoy the relationship with Jesus that he has with his Father in and through Holy Communion. But we are called to become that mercy that we have received from God. We are called to live the Eucharist, to live Jesus, to let Jesus live in us and love through us. So I want to do a very brief meditation exercise with you. Okay, based on this, I just want you to sit up straight. And if you haven't got your eyes closed, you can close your eyes. Okay. I just want you now to become aware of the noises outside and around you. The noise of the air conditioning the noise outside in the foyer. And I want you to let go of all the world outside of you I begin to bring your attention, your awareness to what you're thinking at this moment in time without trying to control your thoughts, simply become aware of what you're thinking at this moment in time. But the invitation is to go deeper than what I think. So I let go of my thoughts, knowing I can always return to them later. They will still be there waiting for me. So I moved on from my mind, my head. I moved on, down to the chest, to the area of feeling and sensibility. And I begin to bring my attention, my awareness, to what I'm feeling at this moment in time. 
without judging those feelings, whatever they may be, whether I'm at peace or disturbed, whatever the feelings may be, I simply become aware of what I'm feeling at this moment in time. Recognizing that our feelings are like a river that is in constant flow, constantly changing. But I simply acknowledge what I'm feeling at this moment in time. And as I did with my thoughts, I now do with my feelings. I simply let them go knowing I can always return to them later if I so desire, they will be there waiting for me. But I move down from the chest, down to the center of my stomach, to the depths of my being, to the core of my being. And I begin to bring my awareness, my attention to God, who is dwelling in the depths of my being. God, who has poured the spirit of love into my very heart, into the core of my being, where God has chosen his dwelling place in the depths of my being. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I simply bring my awareness, my attention to the presence of God dwelling in the core of my being. And I ask the Holy Spirit to guide me, direct me, enlighten me on this journey. I want you to think of Peter at the charcoal fire. He is standing at the charcoal fire and he's denied Jesus three times. Have a conversation with him. Is there anything you'd like to tell him that you feel ashamed of, guilty about, that you would like to let go of? Talk to him and listen to him. Peter understands and he says to you, put it on the fire, put it on this charcoal fire. What do you want to put on the fire of God's mercy? What do you want to let go of? Place it on the charcoal fire of God's merciful love. And Jesus comes out and looks at Peter and looks at you. Receive his look, his gaze of love, of merciful love. No condemnation, only acceptance and love. 
allow yourself to receive the love that he has for you as he looks into your eyes. And then find yourself on the shore of the beach with another charcoal fire. Jesus, Peter and yourself sitting around the fire of his love. Have a conversation. Talk and listen. What's on your heart? What's in your mind? What do you want to say? Then it happens spontaneously, naturally. If there is anyone that you are finding difficult at the moment, let that be like a log that you're putting onto the fire and talk to Jesus about that person as you place the log on the fire. If there's anyone you feel worried about, let them be like a log that you place on the fire and talk to Jesus about them. If there's any situation that's causing you distress, let it be like a log in the fire that you place on the fire of his love and talk to him about it. But as well as talking, listen for the response. Listen to what Jesus wants to say to you. Then Jesus turns to you and he says, Do you love me? Take a moment or two before you reply to him. Do you love me? And then he says to you, I love you too. I want you to hear him saying to you, I love you too. He then invites you to stand up. We both stand. And he says to you, come over here to me, give me a hug. Allow yourself to be embraced by Jesus. And 
master you, embraces you, hear him say to you once again, I love you too. And so it's time to take leave of Jesus. So thank him for the gift of his love. But no, it's a place you can always return to. He will always be there waiting for you. So having thanked him for his love, you find yourself once again back in the room, seated on the chair. Become aware of the noises outside and around you. And without rushing, but in your own time when you're ready, you can open your eyes. <coughs> Love is like a fire. What matters is that it stays alight. To stay alight, it must always burn something. First of all, it must burn up our egoistic self. It does this by loving, which directs us towards God, by doing his will, or towards our neighbours, by helping them. When we receive the Lord in Holy Communion, St. Augustine used to say, not the body of Christ, but become the body of Christ. We are called to become the body of Christ. Another humanity where he can renew his mystery, where he can live in us and love through us. Live Jesus. Amen.